Please welcome back to the stage our moderator for tonight's discussion, A New Approach to Education, Austin Butner. Thank you. What we're going to try to do uh, is help unpack this idea of meeting kids where they are at a school. I mentioned I'd been part of Junior Achievement, uh, and in my generation, we tried to make something and tried to sell it, and don't ask me what it was, because we probably couldn't sell it. But if you went to a high school today and said, what is the single greatest challenge that exists? I think most of the teachers and educators in the school would say, we have to meet kids where they are. Uh, and how do we provide them with this immersive learning by meeting them where they are? So we've got a group of folks who are all part of this, playing different roles. And we're going to talk a little bit about what does 3D mean, and it's just a name. But it's really providing this immersive experience, connecting the real world, which is what every young adult, every student in school wants to learn about, uh, with the tools and skills uh, and academic learning that can need to be successful in this real world. So I'm going to start with Dante in the end and ask my panelists each to introduce themselves briefly, and in particular focus on your connection to this effort in schools. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Dante Apperwhite. I am a, the Workplace Services Manager at the Deloitte Los Angeles office. Uh, I also serve as a Junior Achievement Volunteer throughout the year uh, and was a part of the Crenshaw 3DE rollout three years ago and have followed that contingent of students throughout their session. And we just started with Dominguez High this year. We had about 72 of them in our office yesterday for an all-day uh, learning intensive, yes, um, and uh, exactly what you said, connecting what we do every day, the experiences that we uh, need to see and who we hire, and making sure that this generation of students gets that knowledge before it's too late. Thank you. Olka. Good evening, everyone. My name is Olka Joshi Hansen. Um, I'm an educator. I'm a mother of two teen boys. Um, but my contribution to this conversation is primarily as a researcher um, looking at, for 20 years, um, my background is in neuroscience and human development, and really thinking about what it means to design educational experiences that meet kids where they are from the perspective of what is it that they need to be healthy and to grow into the adults that we need them um, to be? And so I've worked internationally and nationally looking at dozens of models of schools that are more human-centered in this way. So looking forward to the conversation. Jack? I'm Jack Harris, currently CEO for 3 d Schools at a national level. Uh, but before that, was president of Junior Achievement of Georgia out of Atlanta which is where 3DE was initially uh, developed and incubated in partnership with Fulton County Schools and a few of the other Metro Atlanta school districts. So uh, really excited to be here. That was, uh, Banneker High School was the first high school opened in 2015. There are now 45 3DE schools across 10 states. So Jack, let's start with the basics because some folks in this room are quite familiar, some don't know what it is. What is it? Just in simple terms, describe the program. I'll try as simple as possible. Uh, so, simple and short. Yeah, it's, uh, so 3D is a, a new school model of trying to have high school education and, and learning feel more relevant, feel more experiential, and it's done through case methods. So think of all the core academic subjects, math, science, English, and history, the age-old question of why am I learning this, and it's a way to teach those subjects through the lens of how they're applied into real-world scenarios that brings learning to life. Okay. You've looked at different models. I know you, you're really uh, keen on this model. Why? What's the research tell us? So I often think about schools existing in three buckets. So many of us have heard about the factory model, the industrial model of education. There's pretty good consensus that that does not meet what we need um, in the world today. It was designed 400 years ago. There's a big bucket in the middle that I think of as whole child innovation where we take that model that doesn't really reflect what we know about human development, neuroscience, science of learning, and we try and bolt things on. So we'll bolt on a social and emotional curriculum. We'll bolt on some project-based learning. We'll bolt things on. But we never change the design. And then this third bucket I talk about as human-centered 
is designed very intentionally around a very different set of answers to the question of what is the purpose of education? What do young people need at the developmental stage they're in, whether it's elementary, middle, or high school? And then how do we make choices about what we teach and how we teach it? And to my mind, the, the sort of bolt-on approach, it's part of the frustration of the last 30 years of improving education, because we've tried intervention and projects, and they don't take, because to transform things, you have to design from the ground up. So to my mind, it's both that it's a sustainable way of getting a better way of doing education, and it actually reflects what we now know about neurodiversity, about how learning happens, and about what young people need, right? Birth through 25 is a really unique period, and we have to meet kids where they are in terms of their needs. So Jack, I walk into school, I know most of us, we walked in, we had first period, second period, third period, we had math, literacy, homeroom, home ec, whatever it might have been. Uh, what's a case like? Just unpack, what's a case like? What is it, what, give us an example. So think in a traditional high school, you still have those subjects, and in public education, there'll still be state accountabilities tied to it, so we, we honor that. The difference is, is that in almost all of our high school experiences, those subjects would have sat in silos. So math was math, science was science, English was English. They weren't connected to each other, and most of the time they wouldn't have been connected to anything outside the classroom. So that is, you know, research would show you is connecting what's learned in the classroom to what's happening in the outside world or the experience in a student's life. That is the number one determinant as to whether or not a student will be engaged in their own learning. And so to drive engagement, we create these interdisciplinary environments where real world case scenarios that are developed with companies like Deloitte and others are designed in a way that they are interwoven through all of those subject areas. So as a student, I'm hearing about this case from Deloitte and this challenge in math and science and ELA and, and history and social studies. And I'm working in small group teams to collaborate, analyze, solve for that challenge that Deloitte's working on in a real time setting. And then presenting my solution as a student back to Deloitte in a five week period. And every five weeks in a 3DE school, there's another case, another challenge, co-written with another industry and employer, opens students' minds broadly to the opportunities that are out there and prepares them for skills that they can take and, and navigate into the future. Dante, so the employer now enters the picture. I heard that word used. Give us your perspective. What is it you're seeing with students who participate? Uh, what is it you're looking for? maybe different, uh, so students are ready to become part of the Deloitte family. Yeah, uh, and I am not gonna take the whole time, even though we've, already, we've been talking for hours. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it's a really wonderful intersection, and we've talked about this already, where students are. And I think in the space of 3DE, we are allowed to give the students the, the flexibility to be 13, to be 14, to be 15, and to think like a, 14, 15, 16 year old would think, but connect something you were talking about, their creativity, their perspective on the world. What is it that you think needs to be changed in your community? And what are the steps to actually accomplish those changes? Whether they be professional or societal or economic. Um, a lot of these students are tossing these ideas in their head every day, but as a junior achievement alumni myself, as a third grader, no one talked to me about these things. No one brought these things to the table and asked me my opinion. And as a person in the business world, we're able to ask that question, work with the students to find a solution, and then my piece is to connect that conversation to, in about 15 years, you're gonna be in this exact same room interviewing for a job. How can we get the answer you just gave me to be ready for me to say yes to you, rather than, I really wish someone had talked to you about your cover letter, or I really wish someone had talked to you about your presentation skills. So how many employees does Deloitte have worldwide? Worldwide, about 420,000, give or take. <laughs> That's a lot. Yes. Uh, what are you looking for different? I mean, part of this mm -hmm. comes from an imperative, you want mm -hmm. a more diverse workforce, you mm -hmm. want a workforce that's better prepared yep. to be those critical thinkers. Yep. Yeah, I mean, we're dealing with some really big problems, y'all. And we're gonna need some new solutions. We new, need new ideas. And uh, 
I'll tell you right now, and I said this yesterday when we had the students in Dominguez, uh, from Dominguez High, I, I don't need a room full of people staring at me when we have a big question or a big problem at the table. I need ideas, I need thoughts. I need, this didn't work last time, how about we try it this way? And the flexibility to be able to meet yourself where you are, meet your community where it is, and to find pathways of solutions. The, the, the stagnant doesn't work. And, and having a group of people at least willing to hash it out creatively, professionally, of course, um, is really necessary today. Can I just jump in here? Because I also think we have to take the current context into perspective. And one of the huge pieces is the pace of change, in part because of technology and non-biological intelligence and generative AI. And the reality is that we need human beings to lean into their comparative advantage. And part of it is we have the capacity, we need to build the capacity to deal with ambiguity, to kind of do the things that technology can't do. And those are the sorts of things that you don't develop by being told in a class. You only develop the ability to deal with ambiguity or to be okay with being uncomfortable or to take risks and fail and move through them by doing them. And so programs like 3DE right, allow young people to learn the kinds of skills that are particularly important for young people today because we are preparing them for a world that we can't predict, nor can they. And these are the kinds of durable skills that are gonna serve them. So I just wanna go back to that meeting yesterday, 75 high schoolers from Dominguez. And by the way, I think somewhere the superintendent of Compton is here, shout out. Um, I just want to acknowledge his leadership and Maynard and others. This is a revolution in schools. It's not evolutionary. And so the commitment of school leadership, teachers to say, okay, we're going to change our practice. We're, we're maybe five years or 35 years in this craft, uh, in what I do in a school, and I'm going to throw it all on the table and reshuffle it. So thank you for your leadership in Compton. Uh, Dante, tell us most interesting questions students asked. <laughs> I'll tell you right now, uh, I had a 14-year-old ask me something about taxation, and I still don't understand what this kid was talking about. <laughs> um, and, and how awesome is that? How awesome is that? I'm sure he's not reading the Wall Street Journal every day, but wherever he got that tidbit of connection, and to your point, that human aspect of problem solving that just a computer just can't do. It can help us, it can get us closer, it can do the mundane, but there's a human element that these kids have. They just need to be encouraged. They need to be sh uh, uh, sh uh, shaped, right? They need the experience. Um, yeah, I mean, they are super passionate about their world. And quite frankly, they know it doesn't work. They know it doesn't work. They see it in their homes. They see it in their communities. The question is, are they invited to find the solution? because they will either be engaged or we will tell them that they don't matter. And I think the power of this, this organization and the power of this, this program is we are welcoming them to the table and we are at least starting those sparks of one, you matter, two, what you want the world to be, it will be, with hard work, with you know, investment in yourself, et cetera. Um, but that, that's what we're talking about. Right. Now, Jack, I want to, let's roll the clock forward because we're three years into this experiment in the Los Angeles area, but when we first met four years ago, something like that, um, Atlanta, we sent a team out and said, okay, is this real? And are the results there? So tell us what you've seen because uh, I think this concept, maybe most of us can grasp, but the results are compelling. And just take us through what the experience has been, those early adopters, schools in Atlanta, what you've seen. Yeah, absolutely. And um, I think your point about uh, how much this takes to change practices is huge. It is a big change management initiative in terms of having principals and leaders and teachers think about the work differently. But the results then speak to that it's working. So it, across all of our 3DE schools, what we significantly see is huge upticks in attendance first, because the students are beginning to be engaged, you'll see higher levels of attendance. We then see um, 
decreases in chronic absenteeism around 20% year over year on chronic absenteeism, graduation rates that are up 26%, post-secondary enrollment that's up 15%, reading and math proficiency that um, are well outpacing cohort peers. And in most cases, these are students that would be the students that are walking through that ninth grade anyway. This is not something that subsets certain kids, that has selection criteria. It's whoever that incoming ninth grade would be and then how that transitions ninth through twelfth grade. The other piece too, just to add to this, teacher retention is 90%. Um, sense of belonging, we see about a 70% increase in students that say that they feel accepted, respected, and included at school. These are huge foundational culture and climate elements that then foster sustainable change in schools so that it isn't just about a bolt-on, but it really is about a comprehensive solution that's forever changing the trajectory of these students' lives and, and the careers of the teachers as well. And one of the things that, um, that Olka mentioned that I think is really important to note, the, the guiding principle for this work was that we were approached by a superintendent in Fulton County who we know really know well, very innovative leader, and he said the pace of change around us is changing at such a rate that whatever we're doing to prepare students for the future, that future is outpacing the change that we're making within the school district. And so how do we think of this entirely different where we're not preparing students for the jobs that exist today because they're not going to exist anymore? How are we preparing them with the skills, the mindsets, behaviors to navigate uh, their own career into the future? And when we say like position them for choice-filled lives. And I think ultimately on the, the impact that we're seeing, our first graduating classes are now graduating college or they've been in the workforce. And what they will continuously come back and say is, I had options, I had choices versus having doors just shut down, uh, you know, shut in front of them. I was gonna ask, so longitudinally now, high schoolers graduating college, more options, better prepared? Yep, absolutely. Dante, great. You see that as an employer? Oh, for sure. And, and, but this is a journey, right? That's, that's, that's something I really actually want to articulate. The beauty of this program is it's not a one and done. Our commitment to Crenshaw is every year for that ninth grade class. They're in their junior year right now. Our commitment to Dominguez, his, Dominguez High School excuse me, is every year. We're coming back. So you can stare at me blank all you want. You're going to have to talk to me in five weeks and I'm gonna remember your face, right? And you should have saw some of the kids when they pulled into our building yesterday and I went, remember me? And they went, oh goodness, he never shuts up, <laughs> right? Um, but that's the power of it is the relationship. And this goes back to what you were saying about belonging. You matter. And, you, and especially, I think you know better than anybody during COVID when students were a box they, we stripped them a laptop and that was it. And to be this, for a lot of them, is their first time in front of a human, face to face. I'm going to ask you this question and I'm going to expect an answer. And we're working through that in real time. Well, and if I can add to that, we were talking about this earlier. It's not only while they're in high school. You are building social capital for young people, many of whom don't have it. So there's a lot of research now around the importance of social capital, which is who you know. And we all know this, if we have children, the jobs we work in, who you know matters. And one of the biggest things we can do for students who come from some of the hardest circumstances or have the families that don't yet have the resources to give them connections is the social capital. You will have people, you probably do, who come back to you because they know you. They know the people we work with. And that is something we don't really even talk about in education just now, but it's an, a hugely important thing. One quick thing, sorry. Resume building. You have been in a Deloitte office presenting. Put that on the resume. You've already been here. You already know what that's like, right? And so what used to be a blank stare when I said, well, what are your professional skills or what have you done? We're at least giving them those tools in real time and space for them to even understand what it is we're even asking for. Let's talk a little bit about some of the barriers. Um, Obviously, you see we're believers, um, but it's not in every school. Uh, the change management piece you spoke of. So we've got to convince educators to take a risk to try something different and turn their world upside down. What else? What, what are the other barriers to do this? Yeah, the risk is big yeah, in terms of political will. Um, and so that's why the leadership, the names that you called out already, it's so important, you know, just in terms of having leaders that are willing to step out. Um, I think one of the things that we, we 
identified early on, because part of the design of the model was to identify why change hasn't happened. If everybody understands what the issue is, like why don't we see more change? And a lot of it is just being provide implementation support to teachers. Oftentimes, you know, teachers might be given training or curriculum or new ways of doing things, but they don't necessarily have the support behind it to work through that change and actually feel comfortable with it. And so that's a big, that's a big lever. Um, I'd say, uh, in addition to that, um, in public education, part of it is that there's, sometimes there's a stuck narrative that change is impossible. It's, this is the way it's always been, can't change it, will be. Sometimes from a philanthropy perspective or a business community perspective, people might get fatigued with that idea. I think one of the things I always say with this model is, if anything, if nothing else, it should show that change is possible. And it's very intentional that we call this a joint venture between the education community, junior achievement, and the business community, because all three entities are coming together and bringing their best to the table to create something better for students. And I think that piece of it's really important, but it does require all of those players. But how do you, how do you build trust? You know, I, I'll push back on that notion of change. Yes. Um, you know, as a former superintendent, hundreds of ideas, let's do this, let's do this, let's do this, let's change this. We did this last year, this next year. Uh, stop, stop, slow things down. Let's figure out what is working, are people bought in, if this is working, yeah. let's double down. If this isn't, let's not. Um, how do you help schools sort through that? I'm curious, Olka, as a researcher, uh, one thing I saw as a superintendent is, frankly, most of the research was short. Uh, you know, we, six months, extraordinary results, change everything. Let's change our math curriculum. Well, maybe not. Uh, uh, or whatever it might be. How do you think about that from a research perspective to build conviction that it is working and then trust in a school community that this is something worth changing for. Oh, good heavens. Um, that's a small conversation. Um, and people are too glass of wine in. I think there are different levels, right? So I think you have different conversations with some of the schools where leaders are stepping up to say, we want to do this. There, it's more about helping teachers change practice and developing structures inside of schools and districts to allow these things to happen, right? You have to be willing to count learning wherever it happens. Maybe it's happening at Deloitte and kids should get credit for that. Maybe it's that we need to count not only test scores in literacy and math, but we need to be thinking about other things. For places that aren't quite there, I think it is often about starting with the conversation, what does education need to do for our children today? Not when I went to school 25 years ago, today, and then to kind of like give a vision of what's possible, which is why I think it's so important that programs like 3DE and the models and the proof points that we have are super important, but to show that it can be done. I think for many educators, leaders, even system leaders, what's hard is you don't know how to build something you've never seen. And so like having these proof points and then being able to tell the story and to get more people sort of invested in that vision is part of it. But there are a lot of um, kind of systemic and structural pieces which we make. Because, you know, what I'm, what I'm talking about is system change now, not can this be embraced by leadership, teacher leaders in a school to say, okay, we'll try. We want to yeah. do this and we're invested. And if Deloitte's going to come back, and we're going to come back and we're going to do this until we make it work. Um, that's not a system, that's, that's a popcorn stand, a very good one, because it's one school. I'm kind of curious, Dante, your experience as you share this with other business leaders, what's the feedback? Are they in, are they coming in, how do they see it? Are they interested in meeting with the students from a Dominguez High like you are? In my opinion, the, the biggest mover is the reality of doing it, is showing up. You can tell me all day that you're doing whatever it is you think you're doing until I asked you when was the last time you did it and you say 10 years ago. I was just, they were just here yesterday. We had another school in last week, right? And I am not an administrator of a major school district, but people want to connect to things that are actually happening, not just ideas. Um, actual stories of change, actual stories of students, um, plugging in and getting engaged. And, and quite frankly, I do think this journey is just starting. And uh, I'm a pioneer with something we have internally. I'm, I'm open for the journey. Let's see what it does. But for me personally, 
those 72 lives sitting in that conference room, if one or five or 20 gets a spark that changes not only themselves, but their uh, economic involvement in this world and for their family, I'm good. And I think that's the partnership that we have. It's not my job to fix it, but I am bringing to the table what I can, which is experience, which is in 10 years, you're gonna be interviewing for a job and this is why I normally don't give someone a job. Let's see if we could teach you that before you sit in the same chair. Uh, and that's the beauty of the partnership, I think, with Junior Achievement and even getting an LAUSD. Who is Deloitte? Why is Deloitte trying to come into these doors, right? Junior Achievement has bridged that gap figured out that relationship, and some of these wonderful people in this room, Dante, we need 10 people on this date for one hour. I'll be there. And we, all we're doing is sharing what we do every single day. And the outcome, quite frankly, is for you to judge, and for you. And you tell us what that working is. But in the meantime, we're trying to change one student at a time. Yeah, one student, one school. So, so Jack, yeah, yeah that's great. Uh, how many years in now? This is the ninth year. Okay. Uh, roll the clock, I guess, nine more years forward. Um, where will this effort be? Our goal, and this baby gets to some of what you're asking me for too, is that um, if this really is about changing broader systems level st uh, structures for the future, that in the school districts where we're working, we'd like to have 3DE represent at least a third of the high schools in those districts. A level of critical mass that then begins to change um, broader structure. So if it's working in these third of schools, why couldn't those same types of practices work in the other two thirds? Uh, so that's been a goal of ours to you know, th think of how critical mass affects broader systemic change and then create tipping points where that then begins to cascade in ways that stretches that impact even further so that the investment of dollars on the front end or the investment of time or leadership on the front end actually extends beyond that point. So as an example, by 2030, we have a goal to have 350 schools, um, and, but that they're focused within a lot of these metro area school districts in a critical mass type of way. Um, We'll talk a little bit later because I think part of the program is uh, we're here tonight to help raise support for junior achievement. Uh, what does it cost? What's, what's it cost to get started at a school and to maintain it at a school? Yep, great question. So starting a school average about $250,000 a year to get it up and started. Um, if you think about what that cost is incrementally in terms of what's already in place, it's only about 5% of the total cost of what goes into running a comprehensive traditional high school. So for the private sector, it's a really smart, effective investment to, to leverage a public-private partnership that can create those types of results. And then as it gets critical mass within an area, that cost slides down with economies of scale, so you can get it down to about $150,000 a year in incremental cost. Yukla, same question, nine years from now, what do you want to see from this? Uh, as a researcher, to be convinced this is, this is a, a good approach, uh, maybe not the only approach, but a good approach and ought to be maintained. Certainly, this kind of scaling of it. I'd also love to see these kinds of programs move into the middle and elementary schools, right? You, we talked about challenges you have when you get high schoolers because we've actually educated them into not wanting to take risks, not asking questions, et cetera. Um, but I think part of it is how do we also then invest, you know, any innovation requires structures, systems, policies to support them. And so nine years down the line, what I'd love to see, not only in um, you know, LA, but around the country, is systems and structures that don't support the industrial model. Because that's generally what we have right now, whether it's grading or seat time or credits or whatever. But actually investments, and I, my day job is working with philanthropists. And we're talking with them a lot about both investing in the immediate piece of building schools, but also the longer term work that it takes to build a new infrastructure. And infrastructure might take 10 years to build because it's a process, and yet this is where private dollars, um, philanthropic dollars, really have a role to play because you can take risks and you can invest in things that don't require 
a one-year result or a two-year result, which the public sector can't do. So I think it would be both more of these programs, but also the systems and structures that don't require you to have to swim upstream and figure out how to always navigate being in a public system that doesn't support the kinds of things that you wanna do. And I'd love to hear if that's true. But my observation of schools is that it's exhausting work because the system isn't designed to support it. So it takes this really big effort to make them work. Dante, nine years. Short answer, we wanna see more qualified candidates from diverse populations. Long answer, we wanna see generational wealth being passed down in those same spaces. We wanna see students who come from situations where their mom, their father, their grandmother, their aunt had to do what they had to do to put food on the table, to put gas in the car, and at least believe that they can go farther. And I think the problem right now is that they don't. They don't. I was, it broke my heart. I was in a classroom a few weeks ago. Teacher asked, how many of you are going to college? Half raised their hand. And they weren't even seniors. So what about this life? What about the context we have created has convinced you as a 14-year-old that this life is not worth living to its fullest? And how can we challenge those norms? So we want to give you a sort of, yes. I think we can agree on that. A sense of this program, and this, for me, again, life coming full circle, we met four, four and a half, five years ago, whenever it might have been, um, and it was that. It was meeting students where they are because we want to prepare students in Los Angeles schools for a future that we don't know what it will be, uh, but if they believe in themselves, if they are critical thinkers, they're gonna be swimming downstream, not upstream, the kids. Um, it's an experiment. Uh, still early, I think the Crenshaw folks would say still early, but progress being shown. Dominguez, you know, welcome to the party. We're excited uh, to see what happens. Uh, but stay tuned because this is the future for junior achievement, right? We're talking about system change and an organization modeling behavior and deciding what its relevance is in the 21st century. This is the junior achievement of the 21st century. Uh, so my hat's off to Les, my hat's off to the whole team at Junior Achievement and all of you for being part of taking junior achievement into the 21st century uh, as we take kids with us. So again, thank you for all. Uh, and they're here, so please ask them questions, and after dinner, you have a chance to uh, learn more from our panelists. Thank you. Thank you.